The images that come to mind when you think of New Orleans are certainly some very Catholic symbols and landmarks. A stunning Catholic basilica is the focal point of our main square. Only in Louisiana do we call our civil counties parishes. And in New Orleans, the entire population of the city celebrates Mardi Gras the day before Lent begins, observes All Saints Day as a day to visit the family tomb, and avidly cheers on the saints. None of this is surprising, given our unique Catholic legacy. In 1718, a Catholic French-Canadian, Bienville, founded the new city of Nouvelle-Orléans for the French crown. From that point on, the fleur-de-lis, a religious symbol signifying the lily-white purity of the Blessed Mother and the mystery of the Trinity became the enduring and indelible symbol of New Orleans, our faith and our rebirth. The expansion of the Catholic faith was as absolute as the expansion of the French colonial empire. In the Catholic European tradition, the focus of our main square, then a military parade ground, was to become an imposing church flanked by a home for the monks, both evidence of Catholic presence. The street names of this new city, now the French Quarter, were to be a constant reminder of our Catholic heritage. According to the practice of the Bourbon monarchy in the 1700s, the only legal religion of the colony was Catholic, and even the slave owners were ordered to baptize their slaves Catholic. Every birth and baptism, whether white, black, slave or free, had to be registered at St. Louis Cathedral. A small Catholic boys' school was established almost immediately by the Capuchin missionaries who sailed with Bienville, and in 1727, Bienville welcomed 12 French Ursuline nuns from Rouen, France, to the new city to operate the Royal Hospital. With excellent nursing skills and expertise in herbal cures, the Ursulines in New Orleans were considered the first female pharmacist in the United States. They cultivated a medicinal herb garden, which is still being used by a famous New Orleans chef. The original convent is the oldest building in the Mississippi Valley and the oldest girls' school in the United States. The sisters quickly began the mission of teaching girls reading, writing, and expert homemaking skills. The Ursulines founded not only a school for the affluent, but separate classes and orphan care for the slaves and free people of color. Current prioress of Ursuline, Sister Carla Dolce, elaborates on the tremendous impact these women of faith had on our community from their present campus in Uptown New Orleans. Well, many people know that we are the oldest school, Catholic school, in the United States. And uh, our mission continues to this day. Uh, we, as Ursulines, stand on the shoulders of the great women who came before us. And we also are sisters to all the women who teach with us in this city. New Orleans remained under the rule of Catholic France and even stricter Catholic Spain for almost another hundred years. Then, in 1803, President Thomas Jefferson purchased the entire Louisiana Territory from Napoleon. New Orleans then became an American city with freedom of religion and freedom of worship. But the Catholic educational traditions established by the Ursulines, Capuchins, and the Jesuits had already taken root during our French and Spanish colonial periods. In 1837, the Jesuits returned to Louisiana and founded St. Charles College and the College of the Immaculate Conception in New Orleans. During the same time those European-based religious orders were arriving, a local religious order was founded by the Venerable Henriette de Lille. Henriette was a wealthy, free woman of color from New Orleans. Henriette founded the Sisters of the Holy Family, the second Catholic community for women of African descent in the United States to serve the poor of all races in 1842. She served as godmother for many slaves and free people of color, thus the prayer room in her honor in the original St. Louis Cathedral baptistry was created. She founded St. Mary's School for Girls, the first of its kind for girls of color. She continued her life of service and care for the poorest citizens of New Orleans until her death in 1862. She was declared venerable on March 27, 2010. 
Sister Doris Goudeau, a sister of the Holy Family, describes the influence Delille had on New Orleans. And she wrote in her prayer book, I believe in God, I hope in God, I love, I want to live and die for God. And I think she took this very seriously. So she wanted to do something to help, the, to help do away with the poverty and slavery and ignorance and malice and everything that was going on, especially among the people of color and the slaves. During the same decades prior to the Civil War, the Irish and German victims of famine and political revolution were also immigrating into the city in droves. These predominantly Catholic immigrants signed on to do the digging of a canal and the most lowly and dangerous manual labor. Even with thousands of these laborers dying under treacherous working conditions, they settled what became known as the Irish Channel. The devotion of these new immigrants was so overwhelming that with pennies collected and with donated labor, the Irish and the Germans built two of the city's most magnificent churches. The Irish worshipped at St. Alphonsus, and directly across the street, the Catholic Germans worshipped at St. Mary's Assumption. Blessed Father Francis Xavier Silos, himself a German immigrant, was one of the area's most beloved pastors. He was a victim of yellow fever, which he contracted while caring for the poor and sick of his community. His national shrine and his cause for canonization makes the Blessed Father Silo Shrine one of the most visited Catholic sites in the country. The profile of Catholic New Orleans, once again, took a new form near the turn of the early 20th century. Italian immigrants, primarily from Sicily, poured into New Orleans as a result of political persecution. Many of the Italians settled in or near the French Quarter, and the quarter became known as Little Palermo. By the early 1900s, much of the more Americanized populace was moving away from the riverfront, leaving the decaying French Quarter and riverfront markets a natural environment for the traders and shopkeepers from Sicily. St. Mary's Church on the Ursuline property in the French Quarter was renamed St. Mary's Italian Church, the center of the New Orleans Italian community. The dire needs of these new immigrants spawned the heroic intervention of another saint of the downtrodden, this time a relentless Italian-born missionary, St. Francis Xavier Cabrini. Lovingly referred to as Mother Cabrini, she was sent by the Pope to specifically care for the massive number of poor Italian immigrants in the United States. She came to New Orleans in 1892 and founded a hospital, an orphanage, and a school, which is the site of one of Mother Cabrini's original orphanages. Within the first two decades of the 20th century, Another zealous missionary arrived to serve Native Americans and African Americans and founded the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament. St. Catherine Drexel was born in Philadelphia to a family whose wealth was built in the world of high finance. She knew that the Native Americans and African Americans in most parts of the United States were systematically denied an education beyond the most basic reading and writing. In 1915, Catherine Drexel came to New Orleans and founded Xavier Preparatory School. This institution included a high school with college prep courses and a two-year normal school for the training of teachers. Ten years later, the school expanded to include a four-year undergraduate program. This expansion is now the site of Xavier University at Carrollton and Washington Avenues. Mother Catherine Drexel died in 1955. She was canonized by Pope John Paul II in the year 2000. Following World War II, with the beginning of the baby boom and the growth of the suburbs, there was a need for more schools, both public and Catholic. Most of the area's parochial elementary schools were run by the archdiocese, were co-educational, included grades K through 8, and under the administration of a community of religious sisters. Through the 60s, the presence of religious teachers and administrators was common in every parochial elementary school in the Archdiocese. Jari Honore, a recent St. Augustine graduate, reflects on the benefits of the city's unique Catholic school culture. Well, being a Catholic in New Orleans is, is uh, such an enjoyable and a wholesome experience because we live in a city that, that uh, 
it's so Catholic in its history, uh, we get a chance to live our faith and to exercise the things that we're taught in our faith as a majority rather than a minority. During the same decade that gave rise to suburbs in New Orleans, integration in public and Catholic schools became another significant issue. In 1962, New Orleans Archbishop Rummel decreed that separate but equal would no longer be tolerated in Catholic schools. The process of implementing integration in elementary and high schools took place without major incident during the 60s. Academically, the Catholic elementary and high schools of New Orleans have always exceeded state and national standards. New Orleans area Catholic schools are frequently commended for low dropout rates, high percentage of graduates, above average standardized test scores, high attendance rates, and the large number of national merit finalists. 98% of New Orleans Catholic high school graduates elect to attend colleges and universities and have been expected to complete hundreds of hours of service in the community as part of their Catholic training. Young Catholic high school girls share the personal impact of their service. It's a lot more than just helping people. It's about and do it, getting your hours in. It's about helping others and serving your community and making a difference. When I was 18 months old, I lived a failure and my parents stayed at a Ronald McDonald House in Dallas and the people there helped them, so I decided to give back to them. This all stopped on Monday, August 29, 2005, when Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans and the Gulf Coast. Levees were breached and 80% of the city and surrounding areas were submerged. Initially, officials estimated a 90-day waiting period before allowing for re-entry into the ravaged city. Telephone communication was cut off because towers and servers were destroyed. Television communication was limited due to lack of electricity. Through radio emergency announcements and word of mouth, evacuated school officials and parents were advised to enroll their children into the nearest schools as soon as possible. Catholic schools in the neighboring cities of Baton Rouge, Lafayette, and Houston, after contact and advice by administrators from New Orleans, arrived at creative solutions in the form of satellite schools, mergers, and platoon systems in order to bring the displaced New Orleans students together to continue their education. Everyone's purpose was the same, to continue the educational mission of Catholic schools and to provide some structure sorely needed by students and families at this time of physical, financial, and emotional uncertainty. The city's floodwaters receded and some of the Catholic schools became habitable. Boys and girls from a number of schools were combined in various Catholic school settings. The rebuilding of many Catholic schools after Hurricane Katrina is the stuff of legend. Service from Catholic and non-Catholic church groups and schools from around the United States, private and government donations from around the world, contributions from grassroots fundraisers and individuals can never be measured. The miraculous generosity and response of others to the schools of this area so awed the citizens of New Orleans that the community could finally see a silver lining in the devastation endured. Going to Catholic school is, is a great gift that uh, my parents and my grandparents were able to give me something that they had. Um, it, it gave uh, me a sense of discipline very early on from the sisters and the priests who, um, who ran our schools. Uh, also a sense that education was something that you acquired not for yourself primarily but so that you would be able to, to help others that everything that you learned was to empower you to be able to do um, greater and better things for other people. During this era of continued rebuilding and repopulation, the Archdiocese of New Orleans will continue its mission, which began 300 years ago, to provide excellent Catholic education to all who desire its services and to form young adults of service who continue to witness to Catholic teaching.